All right, let's get started. Um, welcome to the second lecture of the NP Completeness Unit. Uh, the topic of today is uh, something called satisfiability. So we talked sort of generally about the theory of NP completeness and what are these structural complexity classes and the problems involved with them and then how all of this, um, we sort of have a lower bound, um, a way to show a lower bound on a problem conditional on if P does not equal NP and that we think, uh, we're, we're fairly certain that P does not equal NP even though we don't have any way to show it so that uh, what this allows us that is that we can declare a problem to be NP complete then this gives us the ability to elevate it to a special class. All of them have this privilege that um, solving one NP complete problem would solve them all uh, efficiently. And today we're going to get into a few NP complete problems. Uh, first, let's review what a reduction is. So if you, th you should think about the complexity classes as if they're plotted on a scale. I don't have any markers today. As if they're plotted on a scale, so we have P here, and then you can think that we have NP here, and we did argue that uh, NP, uh, P was a subset of NP. Now to prove uh, for some problem P, uh, B, to show a B is NP complete, you have to do two things. One. It has to be in NP. You first need to show B is in NP. To show a problem is in NP, you need to give a polynomial time verifier. You have to give an algorithm which on input a problem instance you and a witness that you can grade the problem efficiently. Now, you're not going to solve the problem. This is something that's new for a lot of people is because you've been doing algorithms. Uh, you've been given a problem, you solve the problem. There's no solving any problems today. I'm going to emphasize that a lot more. We're just simply going to either check the problem solution, check someone else's solution efficiently, or we're going to be translating problems uh, and, and their solutions from one solution to another without knowing what the solution is. It's all translation. Uh, second thing you have to show is uh, for all uh, L that is in NP, that there is a polynomial time reduction from L uh, to B. Now, in practice, no one has ever done this except one time in history. Uh, we'll talk about that later, but you don't actually have to do this. How do you show for every single problem in NP that there is a polynomial time reduction from every problem to a problem B? In practice, you don't do this. What you do is instead you, you, you choose A, uh, the, some known NP complete problem, And then you simply prove a reduction from that problem. So you're going to prove there's a polynomial time reduction from A to P uh, to B. There's a, there's a polynomial time reduction from A to B. Now what does this mean? The reason you can do this is because if A is known to be NP complete, then the property that we've said before for all L in NP, there's a polynomial time reduction from L to A. That's true if A is NP complete. And if you can prove a reduction from A to B, then it's from L to A to B, so it's from L to B. So that has the same property. Then you only have to do a reduction from one problem to one problem instead of every problem to one problem. And that makes it easier. Um, this only works if you have a known NP-complete problem, though. And we will give you today a first uh, known NP-complete problem. And um, we'll talk about many variants of it and how, how, how all those can be NP-complete as well. Let's, let me remind you on the definition of a reduction. Uh, we say that there is a polynomial time reduction from A to B, and we write this as A less than or equal to PB. You should think of this as A is easier than B or equal to, or B is harder than A or equal to. So you can upper bound and lower bound the difficulty of them with respect to polynomial time computation using this reduction. Now to show, another way to think about, again, uh, get these two properties, to show a problem is in NP, you've shown it's somewhere between P and NP. It's somewhere here, right? Think of it as an, like uh, when, you look, when you show something is less than it and something is greater than it, it could only be equal to it, right? If you show A is less than or equal to B and B is less than or equal to A, then the, it's only the case that they're equal. It's kind of the same idea we're doing here. Um, by showing B is an NP, you've shown it's not harder than NP, right? It's not, there's so many larger classes we didn't define. Polynomial space, exponential time, yes? Yes. 
Great question. It probably, and it's sort of conditional, it's higher time complexity with respect to polynomial computation. So like, it doesn't mean, it, you cannot compare a cubic and a quadratic time algorithm using polynomial time reduction, because what the actual degree of the reduction is is hidden from you. You just know that such a reduction must exist. And if the reduction does exist, it's like exponential versus polynomial, and not like n cubed versus n squared. By harder, we do mean it takes a longer time to compute. Um, right. So you've sh if you can show it's an NP, you can, bound, you can upper bound the difficulty. If you can show it's uh, NP hard, this property is called NP hardness. If the problem is NP hard, then you know that it's harder than the problems in NP. Uh, you could lower bound its difficulty here, right? So if you can show that it's in NP, but it's also harder than all of NP, then it's the hardest problems in NP. That's why these are called NP complete. It's right there, right? All the problems go at the tip of NP. There are things, by the way, I don't think I mentioned this last time, there are things in NP we do not believe to be NP complete. We have no way to prove it. Uh, RSA factoring, given two large primes, decompose them. We believe, that's an NP easily, we don't believe there's a way to do it. Um, graph isomorphism and some trivial contrived problems. You can come up with a few, Conditionally, if P does not equal NP, if you assume P does not equal NP, you can find a few problems in here. Um, but we, again, we can't prove P does not equal NP. And if you could find a problem unconditionally, then you would prove, the, you would prove P does not equal NP. We don't know how to do that, though. So NP complete problems all have, like, as you'll see, they all have, like, really general structure. They seem like hard problems. NP intermediate problems are just really weird. They're just uh, a lot weirder. And actually, it turns out, through the structure, they're actually easier. We, we, most of the NP intermediate problems that we think are NP intermediate, we have sub exponential time algorithms for. Like we can solve them faster than exponential time. Um, right. So when we write A, is a, there's a polynomial time reduction from A to B. What we mean is that there's some uh, function F, which goes from A to B, uh, computable in poly time such that it maps the good to the good uh, and the bad to the bad. It's not necessarily a bijection or a surjection or anything like this. And this is the same thing, but I'm going to write it twice so it's clear. You should always think about this picture. Uh, it maps the elements of A uh, to uh, B, and it maps the elements of A complement to the elements of B complement. Right? Good goes to good, bad goes to bad. You should always think about this photo. It's not necessarily a surjection, it's not necessarily a bijection, it's none of those things. Uh, not, it's none of those things necessarily. All it does is have this correctness property is that it good goes to good and bad goes to bad. Uh, the reason we want the reduction to take polynomial time. There are many definitions of reduction, it turns out. There's Turing reductions, uh, many one reductions, there's uh, log space reductions, you know, there's all kinds of diversity of things that people want. For NP completeness, we want this reduction function f to be computable in polynomial time because we want s the translation of the problem to be quote unquote easier than solving the problem. And we think the problems take exponential time to solve. Can't prove that, but we think that the problems take exponential time to solve. So we don't want the reduction to be so powerful as to allow solving the problem. We just want the reduction to be simple and easy, and that's why we say it's polynomial time, and it translates, the, it translates the problems, and as we'll see today, it'll translate the solutions as well. It translates the problem uh, such that if it's solvable here, it's after translation, it's still solvable. If it was unsolvable, it's still unsolvable, right? Good goes to good and bad goes to bad. You should always think about this picture. Now, how do you prove this in practice? Uh, like, let's say you came up with a reduction. You need to prove the correctness of a reduction. There's two ways to do it. First, you can show, like, x is in A implies uh, that f of x is in B. And what does it mean, x is in A, that, like, if x has a solution, f of x has a solution. Uh, and then you could also show that if x, uh, if x never had a solution, then f of x also still never has a solution. Right. That's equivalent to showing the if and only if. There's another way to do it, though, and this is probably the safest way. There's another way to do it, which is that you could show that x is in A uh, implies f of x is in B. 
but also that if f of x was in b, if after you're, you've performed the map, the answer has a solution, it could have only been the case that what you mapped from has a solution. Usually this one is more straightforward. Sometimes this one is obvious and easy to do, right? But both of these will show the if it only if property. You have to have the if it only if property. Why, if you just have only one of them, then you could map every, every problem to like one solvable problem trivially. So the reduction needs to, to have this uh, if and only if scenario, right? Any questions on just the definition of a reduction? We haven't seen a reduction yet, so we're kind of double defining something, but we don't know what one looks like, and we'll do several today. Any questions on just the definition of what a reduction is? All right, let's go through, let's actually give you what a, uh, re, let's give you a problem which is NP-complete. It's called SAT for satisfiability. And basically we have a variable uh, is one of x1 through, let's say, xk. A literal is one of x1 through xk or the negation of x1 through xk. Now, this is a, SAT is a logical problem. It's going to be a, like a given a, a, a Boolean formula, of a, formula of, of, of a specific form. Does it have uh, a solution or not? That's basically what SAT is going to be. But we need to define it. Um, a clause is an or of many literals. So x1 or not x5 or x7, something like this. Or let's say x10 or not x Nine, something like this, right? So a clause is you take a bunch of literals and you or them together. Finitely many, of course, but you or them together. That's what a clause is. And then, a f and then we say a formula is in C and F. And C and F here is um, conjunctive normal form, means that you just and together a bunch of clauses. So let's say uh, x or y and x or z or not w or x uh, and w, something like this, right? So variables are going to be these literal, this is going to be the letters, right? Literals are going to be variables of their negation. Uh, clause is going to be an or of literals. And uh, a formula is going to be an and of clauses, right? So the way CNF looks, and you have to remember this, because don't think it's the other way around. It's very different than an and of ors is very different complexity-wise than an or of ands, and that's one of the problems with the homework, I think. But the ands, you take a bunch of the clauses, uh, and you have to and them together, right? So an assignment to a formula is a selection of xi uh, in a zero or one to make the formula phi true, right? So a formula has an assignment. Actually, we could say false even, but a true assignment to a formula is one where you can assign the variables to one or zero, true or false. You compute the ands, the ors, the nots, and the formula outputs true. So what is SAT in, as a problem statement? SAT as a decision problem is the set of formula in C and F, such that uh, phi is a satisfiable C and F. Um, this is the statement of what phi is. Excuse me, sat. Yes. Right. So clause is just an or of a bunch of things together. You just or the things together. And a formula is going to be in CNF form, conjunctive normal form, is if you can and together a bunch of clauses. So you can think of it that you have these parentheses. Outside the parentheses, you have ands only. Inside the parentheses, you have ors only. That's the way to always, I always think of CNF. See, there's an or there, or, or, or. There's no ors here, but it's still in CNF. Uh, this is a clause of length one. This is a clause of length one, two, three, four. And this is a clause of length two, right? Yes, only an or. Yes. So 
an element of zero one, so either a zero or a one. Uh, an assignment is a selection, uh, oh, to make phi true. Yeah, and so I really should say not an assignment, but a satisfying assignment, right? Because you can have an assignment that makes it false. We care about the ones that have assignments to make them true, though. More questions on um, SAT, just the definition? Phi, big, big Greek letter, yeah. Phi is a formula. We will reserve uh, phi for formula. Big capital phi is a, usually a formula. So phi is going to be something in CNF. This is phi, for example. And it has as its variables x, y, z, w, right? More questions? Yeah? An assignment is you choose an ass every, ver you evaluate every variable to be 0 or 1. You don't evaluate some of the variables and then you leave a bunch of free variables. An assignment is you like evaluate every variable to 0 or 1. And it's satisfying if an assignment of the variables can output uh, a zero or a one, right? Yeah, right. If you plug in a one or a zero for every letter here, if you plug in a one for W, this is going to be a zero. So then, if you plug in a one for X, oh, there's X in here twice. That's fine. It turns out, but you can you can have X equals one, and X is one here. So this is satisfiable. It turns out, yeah, yes. Yes. A literal is a variable or a negation. So when you define a clause to be an or of literals, it's a or of the variables or the negation of the variables. So for example, here we have w, and here we have not w, right? Does that answer your question? No. Here, for example, w and not w appear. So if a formula, and this is actually very important to the structure, if, if, if uh, x can appear in one clause, not x can appear in a different clause. They can even appear in the same clause, right? Um, let's talk about some of the structure of SAT. So SAT is like, it's surprising the huge diversity. I mean, we're going to prove SAT is MP complete, so it better have you know, a lot of structure in the problem. But it doesn't seem that complicated, yet it has the ability to, to mimic so many constraint problems. I mean, if you think about it, here's one idea. Like, if you and a bunch of things together, all of them need to be true, right? That's the definition of and. So if you could think of each clause like a bunch of constraints, you need to satisfy all constraints. But each constraint may be satisfied in multiple ways, because to satisfy this clause, you can do x or y, but not neither. You need to have one of x or one of y, something like this. So if this formula does have a satisfying assignment, it has to be one with x on or y on or both, something like this. So like if you think like maybe like laws, you need to comply with every single law, but uh, there's no way to, uh, but given a specific law, there's maybe multiple ways to comply with it, something like this. Another an analogy is like if you're ordering food and like the guy won, uh, he wants a burger or gyro or Cheeseburger, but then guy two says, I don't want burger, and I also don't want gyro. You know, something like this. No, I don't want burger or cheeseburger, something like this. So you need to satisfy both people about what they want or don't want, and um, the only solution then is uh, not getting burger, not getting cheeseburger, but getting gyro, right? Something like this. So you need to satisfy all people, but they have a set of constraints about what they want. This guy wants burger. This guy says, I don't want burger. But not only do I not want burger, I don't want you to order burger. So something like this, right? There's many, many such formulas. Many problems can be formulated as an and of ors. Few problems can be formulated as an or of ands. 
right? To satisfy, suppose you had DNF form, disjunctive normal form, to flip it around. If you had, if those were all ors and you had anded them, all you would do is like look towards the smallest clause. Because you can, if you have a bunch of things you're oring together to solve it, all you need to do is solve one clause, right? Here, you need to solve every clause. That's what makes this hard. So finding a solution to this in general is not easy. Yeah? Uh, f uh, the, uh, the C and F specifies that the ands have to go outside the clauses and the ors have to go inside the clauses. That's important, it turns out. You couldn't do an and inside or an or outside. Right. Um, more questions on just the definition? And I'll give you another example of a constraint problem. Uh, so suppose you had variables x1 xn, uh, y1 to yn, and suppose I gave you uh, the following uh, c and f, x1 or uh, not y1. And by the way, sometimes for simplicity, instead of drawing the literal logical negation as that little hook, I'll put a bar over the y1, and it should, you should understand it's the same thing. This is negation of y1. This is the literal, which is the negation of the variable y1, right? Um, or uh, excuse me, and um, uh, x1, not x1, or y1, uh, and that, that, that. And suppose I did that for every n. So we did uh, xn or yn not, and uh, xn not or uh, yn, something like this, right? So when is this, what is the satisfying assignment of this formula? Suppose I did it for all two to the n variables. I added two clauses, each of length two for all two to the n variables. When is this formula satisfiable? Hmm? It's always satisfiable? Well, what if x1 I may have written it wrong, let me double check. If x1 is a zero and x1 is one, it's not satisfiable, yeah. Right. When is this formula satisfiable? Never satisfiable? No, I think it should still be satisfiable. I think there's an assignment of the variables that make it satisfiable. That is true. There's a more general answer, though. Yeah, this is a CNF formula for string equality. So phi of, we'll just call it x and y, is 1 if and only if uh, x equals y. Right? Notice that for each xi here, if x1 is 1, then we know that this x1 is a not 1, is not 1. So that's 0. So for this clause to be satisfiable, it forces y to be 1. So if x1 is 1, it forces y1 to be 1. If y1 is 1, this is going to be a 0, so it forces x1 to be 1. So the satisfying assignment can be thought of in a more complicated than a chain of implications. Right? We're lucky that this is, these are clauses of length 2, but when you have something more complicated, it's like this variable being off forces the decisions of other variables to be on, something like this. Right? So this. Uh, the only, and it is true that if they're all set to one, because this would be one, this would be one, this would be one, this would be one. But um, it's also true if they're all set to zero, because that would be one, that would be one, that would be one, that would be one, right? So it's, it's you can do a surprising amount of things with the CNF formula. Uh, I can't even begin to explain to you how many things you can do with the CNF formula. Um, you could, it's, it, it, it's so powerful that you can encode all of NP into a uh, CNF formula. So any more questions on this formula? We're going to prove sat now is NP complete, quote unquote, prove it. Yes. X is a sequence of variables, X1 to X1, X1 to Xn. Y, let's suppose it's a sequence of variables, X1 to Xn. Now, I claim this formula is satisfiable if and only if X equals Y. If X1 equals Y1, X2 equals Y2, X3 equals Y3. I claim that, that that's the only scenarios that this formula is satisfiable when those two are the same. Right. Let's prove sat is NP complete. 
So we're going to prove SAT as an NP complete. First, let's prove SAT as an NP. Okay. Why is SAT an NP? This one, uh, it's the first one we've done maybe. Let's, let's describe it. To prove a problem is an NP, so to prove a problem is NP complete, you show it's in NP and you show it's NP hard. Uh, yes? Yeah, we can do that. So let's describe the verifier. To prove a problem is, uh, you have to prove it's NP, it's NP hard. To prove it's NP, you need to give a polynomial time verifier. So you say uh, V on input phi, and then you have to make a decision about what the witness looks like. The witness is going to be what? The witness, again, is the answer we're grading. Suppose someone gave you a formula and claimed it was true, they, what was the answer they would write down? Yeah? Let's just call it A1 through AN for assignment and not X, but yes. So that they would give you um, the answer. They would say, oh, this formula is satisfiable. Here's the, uh, here's, the an here's the satisfying assignment. A1 through AN is going to be a bunch of ones or zeros, depend or trues and falses, depending upon uh, that you, if you were to plug those into phi, it would uh, evaluate to true, right? Plug into phi uh, if, tr uh, if true, uh, return true. This is terrible code. If false, return false. I've committed to it. Something like that, right? Now, we need to argue two things. Correctness of the verifier, does this, is this, if, the formula is satisfiable and someone gives us the answer, does this correctly check it? Yeah, all we need to do is plug it in to the formula and evaluate the formula. Now, here's the next question. Okay, so it is correct, obviously, just simply by the definition. And usually, proving a problem in NP is, n is much easier than showing it's NP hard. So this is usually the easy step. Step two, why is the problem, uh, why does the verifier take polynomial time? This is, can be a more open-ended uh, discussion and you know, other people who may teach the same topic may force you to say the actual literal runtime of your verifier. Say it's n squared or n cubed or something. But, um, you know, I come from a background in cryptography. Everything, it depends on who you are, everything is either not polynomial or polynomial. So, like, obviously this is a problem which is polynomial time. Why is it polynomial time requires me to make certain decisions about things I don't care about, like, the, like data structures. Like, what does it mean for the encode? What is the formula encoding given to you? Like if you write a program, how is phi given to you? Is it given to you in a parsed tree way as a special data type? Is it given to you as a literal just string of symbols? Is it given to you, you know, how is this, what, I have to start making decisions about what the encoding looks like. Um, and then given the encoding, I have to make decisions about how does a, given a formula, how do I actually plug things into that formula? Like, I would have to think about what it means for me to have like a propositional logic evaluator. I plug in trues and false, and then I compute the negations, and I compute the ands and ors symbolically. Now, uh, that sounds like a lot of work. It sounds really complicated, and I don't want to do it. But I know that n any way I could do it obviously has to be polynomial time. In fact, it's probably linear time for me to plug in the variables and evaluate them to true or false, right? So you need to make some reasoned argument about why it's polynomial time. Uh, certain problems whose structure is better defined, here I'm not defining what, how the algorithm takes on phi anyway. How does the verifier take on this phi? What does that look like? Uh, when things are less vague, you can be a little more vague about it, and it's, but it's obvious that it's polynomial, right? Here's an example of an unacceptable argument, you know, for a verifier. A verifier may say, oh, I'm going to brute force search for the, um, uh, a, a satisfying assignment and just the witness may be like a bit or something, you know. That wouldn't work because how many, given a formula of n variables, how many assignments are there? Yeah, there's two to the n assignments. Think of phi as, although it's a formula, imagine that you're searching the truth table of it. And the truth table, if it has n variables, is gonna have a, uh, two to the n rows. So it is kind of a hard problem to solve, but as we've seen here, it's an easy problem to verify. Someone gives you the answer, you plug it in, right? Any questions on that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Uh, right, so A1 would be a bit, which is the assignment of X1 in the formula. So this is N bits, and the length of the formula, by the way, in SAT is always the number of variables. So it's gonna be N variables, right? Um, so A1 would be a one, A2 would be a zero, whatever, you plug those bits into the uh, formula and then you output a one or a zero, right? Whatever, however you could, uh, however you could instruct a computer to do that, um, it's, it would, you could check, like say someone, you should think, you can think of a verifier problem as a two, a discussion. Someone gives you an answer and you tell them if they're right or wrong. You don't know how they got the answer. That's not your problem, right? So someone says, oh, I found an assignment. Here you go. Oh, you can check it quickly. Great. Uh, you can check if it's right. You can check if it's wrong and so on. Right? You're, again, you didn't, we haven't solved SAT. We're not writing a SAT solver. We just verified a solution. All we had to do. Yes. Yes. Well, that's, th this is, uh, you know, bad practice on my part. I mean, I'm just uh, stomping around and I'm like, well, that's obviously polynomial. Okay, next step. So, um, and again, I, like I've said, other people have enforced that you would write the literal time complexity of it. But I mean, it's, it's an exercise that I don't really care, to be honest. So. Th this may be a trap for some of you because I'm, I'm sure some of you are going to turn in verifiers that are not polynomial and then just say, oh, that looks polynomial to me, but you're wrong. But, um, oh well, I guess. Uh, right, now let's prove the, hard, quote unquote, prove the, the next way. We want to prove that SAT uh, is NP hard. So we're going to prove for all L in NP that there's a polynomial time reduction from L to SAT, okay? Now, uh, we're not going to do this. This is called the Cook-Levin theorem. So here's, here's the history. Given one NP-complete problem, so Cook and independently this guy named Leonid Levin in the Soviet Union proved that there exists an NP-complete problem. If P, again, assuming P does not equal NP. If P equals NP, then every NP-complete problem is NP, right? So what they did was they showed a way to transform the computation of a verifier into a formula. So what they did was they literally said, okay, we'll let L be an NP, then there exists a verifier for that problem. They showed how to construct a formula that was satisfiable if and only if a verifier returned true. Now, how they did that is actually very complicated. It's lots of programming. They basically used uh, the ands, ors, and nots like uh, programming language to implement every verifier. So they were able to construct a formula that was true if and only if the verifier returned true. That is very complicated, and we're not gonna, that proof, I do it in 4510, it takes like 50, 50 minutes. It's a lot of little basic checks, because you you're limited to a programming language of only ands, ors, and nots. So we're not going to do, redo the proof, and we get to be thankful that they did the proof for us. Uh, Cook and Levin proved, you know, this NP-complete problem exists. They did a different NP-complete problem, but they proved it exists unconditionally. Well, conditional P does not equal NP, but through this way. Then this guy named Richard Karp came around and he proved 21 or 22 different problems are NP complete, but he didn't do so by redoing the proof that Cook and Levin did. He just showed straight from a reduction from SAT. So knowing that SAT was NP complete, he was able to prove a, huge, a bunch of problems were NP complete from across different domains. And he didn't have to redo the proof that Cook and Levin did that's really long and annoying. He just did the simple reduction from SAT. So if you can prove, um, now that you know SAT is NP-complete, you can use SAT in your reduction uh, and map SAT to uh, your problem, right? So now that we know that SAT is NP-complete, uh, everything else, uh, we can use SAT easily in our proofs, assuming it, uh, to show another problem is NP-complete, right? If you can show uh, there's a polynomial time reduction from SAT to B, then that implies that B is NP hard, right? Given that if you knew what the Cook-Levin theorem was, you may assume the Cook-Levin theorem, of course. If you knew the proof, you may, and if you could prove that there's a polynomial time reduction from SAT to B, then that implies that B is NP hard, right? If you combine this fact with the fact that SAT is NP complete, as SAT is in NP, excuse me, B is in NP, then you would prove that B, uh, B whatever your problem was, is NP complete, right? Any questions on this proof that we didn't do? 
All right. So you may now assume that sad is NP complete, right? Um, so given uh, when you prove problems to be NP complete, you're going to choose a problem to reduce from. The only problem we currently know is sat. But what that means is, like, you want to choose the closest problem that sounds like the same problem. If you're doing NP complete problems on graphs, you probably want to choose a graph problem to reduce from. Uh, we only know one NP complete, complete problem right now, which is sat. So we're going to prove uh, some variants of sat or NP complete. So 3 sat uh, is uh, the set of formula such that phi is a satisfiable 3 CNF. Now what is a 3 CNF? A 3 CNF is one whose clause length is at most 3. So for example, x or y or z, and x or not y or not z, or, excuse me, and not x or z, and y. Something like this, right? That's a 3 C and F because every clause has length at most 3. Length of a clause is the number of literals in it. So sat clauses of any length. Sometimes sat is called k sat because it's clauses, that every Formula has a max length clause. So if you just say, you know, it's clause length k, that's what sat is, it's k sat. But clause, uh, if you have at most, 3 sat is a problem with at most three literals. Now, this should, in theory, be a restriction of the problem, right? This seems like if you had to compare intuitively the difficulty of solving one problem or the other, you would probably guess that 3 sat is easier than sat because 3 is less than any other, any, a bigger number, right? Um, but 3 sat, I claim, is NP complete. So this is going to be our first real reduction. We're going to prove that 3 sat is NP complete. Any questions on just what 3 sat is before we get into the weeds? Do you understand the clause length argument? Yeah. Uh, correct. A variable is unnegated, uh, but a literal is either a variable or a negation of a variable. You could have x or y or z, right? No negated. So the clause is not made up of variables but of literals because it allows negations. So this one has no negations, this one has two negations, this one has one negation, this has no negations, right? Does that answer your question? Okay. Literal versus variable, it's, uh, uh, the distinction is only slightly, yeah. NP hard if there's a polynomial time reduction from all of NP to that problem or you choose an NP complete problem and you reduce from it. So if you can construct a polynomial time reduction from sat to B, that would prove that B is NP hard. That's what we mean by NP hard. NP hard intuitively means it's harder than all the problems in NP. You can think of that photo. It's in that uh, dotted circle, right? To prove it's NP hard, it's in that dotted circle. It's harder than NP. Yeah. Exactly. That's the definition of a literal, yeah. Yes, absolutely. And actually, as we are right now at 1012, you can, the only NP complete problem you know is sat. In five minutes, the only two NP complete problems you will, you will know are sat and three sat. So now, after you leave class, you'll be able to use any of the problems we've proved in class that day to, on your homeworks. And in fact, you shouldn't be able to even start the homework without this lecture. Yeah. Yes. Now that is is we'll prove it right now. That should surprise you because it seems like an easier version of the problem. But it turns out through the art of reduction here, you can show it has to be as hard as sat. It's exactly as hard as sat. All right, we'll proceed. Uh, first we'll show 3 sat is in NP and then we'll perform a polynomial time reduction. 3 sat is in NP. All right, why is 3 sat in NP? Yeah, so let's just use the same verifier for sat. Now, 
Now, you probably shouldn't be allowed to say that on homeworks and stuff, but just re-explain briefly what the verifier is. SAT is verifiable in polynomial time. You just plug in the assignment and check it. Uh, the fact that the clause length is at most three doesn't really change that. So you can even copy the verifier here, and it will say the verifier takes as input a three CNF and an assignment to the variables, and it just plugs and chugs the variables in, verifies in polynomial time. SAT is in NP. 3SAT is an NP. Now we want to prove that 3SAT is NP hard, and that will be sufficient for us to prove it's NP. Now we're going to reduce from a known NP complete problem to 3SAT, and that's going to prove for us that 3SAT is harder than that problem. But because we also showed it's an NP, that means that it's as hard as that problem. That problem is, of course, going to be just SAT. So we're going to perform a polynomial time reduction from SAT to 3SAT. Um, now, any questions on, before we get to the reduction itself, any questions on why we're proving that, what we're proving, what it means for something to be NP hard? It's important that we do this first example crystal clear, right? Yes? So you can define things as these Venn diagrams of classes, but it's impolite to call the NP hard problems a class. Um, so we just call it a property of a, of a problem. A problem has the property of being NP hard if it's harder than NP. So it's not really like a class by itself, although you could call it the NP fine, because we do draw it as a circle. But it is open-ended on the other side, because there are lots of problems that are NP hard. Yeah, good question. Yes? Yes. From SAT to 3SAT. It's got to go the right way, yeah. Well, um, so last time we proved, we briefly proved that if there's a polynomial time reduction from A to B and B is in P, that implies that A is in P. We proved this last time. Uh, if you remember, so basically, uh, it's saying that B is harder than A. We're trying to prove that 3SAT is harder than SAT. But we also know that there, by the Cook-Levin theorem, there's a reduction from 3SAT to SAT because we proved that 3SAT was an NP. So they're the same problem, right? If you found a polynomial time algorithm for 3SAT, you also have a polynomial time algorithm for SAT. Perform the reduction from SAT to 3SAT, and then that'll solve, then solve SAT in polynomial time, and that'll solve excuse me, solve 3SAT in polynomial time, that'll solve SAT for you in polynomial time. So the reduction, What we're going to do is convert a clause of length greater than 3 into a set of clauses of length 3. And that is going to preserve, that's going to preserve for us this nice reductive property here, that the solution actually remains unchanged. So what we're going to do is even something more general. We're going to convert a clause of uh, length k to a set of clauses. of lengths at most a k minus 1. So you're going to convert a clause of length k into a set of clauses of length k minus 1, and you're going to reduce the length of the clause. Uh, you're going to repeatedly apply this polynomial amount of times. You'll reduce all clauses to length at most 3. If you believe that we could do this in polynomial time, you apply this a polynomial, amount, a polynomial number of times to the, to the thing. This is a polynomial time reduction from a formula, from any, a formula with clauses of any length to f a, f a different formula with clauses at most length 3. Do we agree with the statement first? OK. Um, suppose we have a clause. Let's just consider one clause. Suppose we have a clause of length, 
uh, k, right? What we do is we convert this to an equivalent, uh, two equivalent clauses. What we're going to do is we're going to add a variable uh, z, and notice uh, this has length k. We're going to convert this to the first uh, k minus 1 literals. We're going to add a dummy variable z here, and then we're going to and uh, xk here with uh, the clause xk or not z. Right. So we converted the clause. We broke off the last uh, one, and ah, I knew it was wrong. There's a typo in the notes. Yeah. So we break off the last two literals of the clause, and we're going to separate them into a clause. Then we're going to add a dummy variable, z, such that z is in uh, the first clause, but the not z is in the second clause. So we broke one clause into two clauses, and now we've added a dummy clause. Right? Excuse me, a dummy literal. Yes. Um, because we wanted this, notice that we took off one and then we added one. So this was actually a clause of length k. It was k minus 1 plus 1, which was k. So we didn't actually reduce the length of the clause. That's why I realized there was a typo in the notes, because that's exactly what the notes did. But this is going to be a clause of length k minus 2 plus 1, which is now k minus 1. This is a clause of length k. This is a clause of length k minus 1. This is a clause of length 3. Right. Repeatedly applying this, you're going to get clauses of length at most three, all the way down to length three. Right. Now, we've, we agree that this is a transformation of formulas, and we will convert sat formulas to three sat formulas. We need to prove that the reduction is correct. So what we're going to do is, is do that. Suppose that uh, phi is in uh, sat. We want to show that the, after you apply the formula that f of phi which is the outputted one, after you repeatedly apply this, is in um, 3 sat. So what we're going to do is suppose that phi is in sat. Phi is in sat if it has a satisfying assignment. So there is a, this formula has some assignment of its variables that will solve it. There is an assignment of the variables you can pick, such that the truth table has a 1 on that column. right? Now, uh, if that's true, that means what? That means one of x1 through xk is on for this clause. If phi is satisfiable, every clause is true. So one variable of x1 to xk, one literal of x1 to xk is true. Do we agree? But not both. I mean, excuse me, it could be all of them on, but it can't be none of them. It has to be at least one of them. Do we agree? OK. If um, it is uh, 1 of uh, x1 to xk minus 2 set z equal to true, uh, then uh, then we know that this formula is a satisfying assignment. If the, if the one that's on is one of these, then this clause is satisfied. So we just need to satisfy this clause. So what we're going to do is just turn z off. Excuse me. It should be off. So then not z turns on. Do we agree? Um, if it is 1 of xk minus 1 or xk, uh, z is equal to 1, right? So whether or not the, the, if you can suppose in the worst case there's a single true. If the single true is here somewhere, 
then you set not z to be on. So this clause is satisfied. If there's a single literal, uh, if, if, if one of xk minus 1 or xk is on, and so even suppose all of those are off, then you just set z to be true, and both clauses are again satisfied. Now, what that tells us is that there's always a satisfying assignment. So from that, we can conclude that f of phi uh, is in 3-sat. So if phi is satisfiable, then uh, f of phi is satisfiable. We've done half of the reduction. Any questions on that explanation? Good. Let's do the other way. Suppose that f of phi, excuse me, that phi was not satisfiable. Then there is a clause that remains unsatisfied, right? Suppose it's this clause. If it's this clause, then we can say that all of x1 through xk is false. Now, if you have 0 or 0 or 0 or 0 or 0, right, you can simplify the clauses that contain those variables, right? 0 or z is going to be equivalent to z, right? So you simplify to what is that going to look like? You're going to have z here you're going to have a bunch of zeros. You're going to have not z here, you're going to have two zeros. That's going to give you z and not z. Is that ever satisfiable? No. That's, in fact, the, it's called a contradiction, right? So we know then that f of phi is never satisfiable. Great. We've proved the correctness. If it's satisfiable, so is after our transformation. If it was never satisfiable, it's still never satisfiable after our transformation. Yes? The, the verifier is the, to prove the problem is an NP, you prove there's a polynomial time verifier for the problem. NP is the class of, pro, is the class of problems which are verifiable in polynomial time. You have to write an auto grader for the problem. And the auto grader takes not only the problem, but a solution. It takes on the solution, and it checks the solution into the problem, right? Whatever that formula format may be. Um, if sad is verifiable in polynomial time, you just reuse the verifier, because the fact that it was verifiable in polynomial time had nothing to do on the length of the clause. Just plug and chug still. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter, but I like to be dramatic, so. A big, big, bold Greek letters, right? More? Yeah? Yes. Yes, let's, ta let's talk about two things. First off, uh, we didn't solve SAT here. We have no idea what the solution is. We didn't even attempt to look for a satisfying assignment. But we were able to transform just the definition of the problem in such a generic way that uh, if there did exist a solution, it's still preserved. This picture still works. It doesn't matter that we didn't even try to find a solution. Just by modifying the way the problem is phrased, and by problem I mean the formula, we can guarantee it's a different problem of a different structure, but the, the existence of the solution or the non-existence of the solution is pre preserved. We didn't go looking for the solution, but yet we can preserve whether or not there exists a solution or not. Yes? The, it's not a contradiction so much as we're doing this. X is in A, if and only if f of x is in B. Here, f of x is the outputted 3 sat formula. X is the inputted sat formula. Then we showed that x not in A implies f of x not in B. What that means is x not in A means x is unsatisfiable. There is no assignment. For all 2 to the n possible assignments, none of them will bring the formula to be a true. Right? That means, the, as a truth table, the whole thing is 2 to the n zeros. Right? If it's un, assume it's unsatisfiable, and then we conclude that the output, three, the three-sided output, also is unsatisfiable. So we just preserve the correctness. It's not so much a, a, a proof by contradiction. You can prove a reduction by contradiction, but to be clean, it's just in implies in, out implies out. That's the, usually the best way to do it. A second comment we can make about this is the fact that this transforms the problem to the problem. But if you notice, you can use this to transform the witness to the witness. 
That's sort of a really deep mathematical idea. If you knew what the solution was, the reduction here can help you transform not just the problem to the problem, but the witness to the witness. The answer, notice the satisfying assignment for this one was also, a sat for this one was also as a function, a satisfying assignment for this one, right? Whatever variables were on, if you could find a satisfying assignment, and I don't think you can, you, I claim you could also transform the assignment itself into an assignment for this formula following the reduction. So it not only transforms problems to problems, deep, a more deeper, deeper in mathematical, it transforms the solution to the solution if we knew what the solution was. We don't. Question? Okay. And it's not infinite. Every formula has bounded length. There's a finite length to every formula, finitely many variables. There could be clauses that are length three. There can be clauses that are length two or one as well, though. So what you're doing is converting one clause of length k to several clauses of length at most k minus one. Then you're going to convert all your clauses of length k minus 1 to clauses of length k minus 2. Reduce those, reduce those, reduce those. You'll be left with clauses of length 3. All the clauses will be of length at most 3. Now the clauses that are already of length 2 and 1, you just don't touch. OK. I claim you add a polynomial amount of variables. And although you are, you're not doubling the clauses, if you think about it, you're adding one clause Per, so let's say if you have k and you're trying to convert a formula of k to k minus 3, excuse me, to 3, for each, you can, you'll add k minus 3 clauses. That's polynomial. You'll add only a polynomial amount of clauses and a polynomial amount of variables. Will the formula look big and ugly? Okay, but it's polynomial. So no. Not mathematically big and ugly. Yes? Ah, uh, notice that we had z, it was z, z to 1 and not z to the other. If we added z to both, that would destroy the correctness. So because it depends on where the satisfying assignments fall. Like let's suppose you just tried to split the clause in half without adding the z. Z is there to balance it out. Like let's say that k, xk minus 1 and xk were both false. You still want that clause after you split it to be true. So you just add the z here to force it to be that you can allow to turn that clause on, but not affect the other clause. Yeah. Um, now, why can we convert to clauses of length 3 and not more? Well, I mean, not shorter. It turns out 2 sat is not NP complete. 2 sat uh, is in P. So most NP complete problems have like, wow, this is so hard, so, so general. You restrict it even slightly. Somehow the problem is incredibly easy. Um, two sat, I claim, is in P. I'm just going to highlight the, uh, I'm not going to do the proof. It's, it's slightly technical, but I'll just kind of highlight uh, like why it works. So if, if you have a two sat clause, you have something of the form like uh, x or y, right? A two sat clause is so easy, right? Turning on x says you don't have to turn on y, but turning off x forces the decision of y to be made. That's not true for a three sat clause. If you have, you know, xk minus one on, or excuse me, off, that doesn't say which one of xk or z, not z do you have to turn on. It doesn't make that decision for you. And two sat, forcing x off does force y on for there to be a satisfying assignment. Second reason is that what do you know about uh, not P or Q. Pop quiz.
What is not P or Q? Definitely not, no. If P, then Q, P implies Q. So every two sad clause is an implication. If you have only two sad clauses, you just have a bunch of implications. Right? What you do, the, here's the way algorithm works. You make a graph, uh, and then you just check, does x imply uh, not x, and does not x uh, imply x? If that's true for some variable, then the formula is unsatisfiable. So in a, like a graph search way, it's slightly technical constructing the graph. But in a, you can just use graph search over the, every two sat clause is an implication. You can create an edge for each implication. X being on imply, X being off implies, uh, you know, so for example, not X would imply Y. Something like this. So you follow a chain of implications, maybe Y implies not Z. And then maybe not Z implies not Y. Well then Y is both true and not true, so it's, it's unsatisfiable. Something like this. Uh, so two sat is easy, uh, three sat is hard. Uh, I have one more NP complete problem I want to do today. Well, it's not actually NP complete, it's just NP hard. So I recently watched the Mario movie, and I didn't like it. It was kind of boring. But uh, we can prove that Super Mario is NP hard. There's a guy named Eric Domain. Um, he has like 3,000 published papers on origami. He like sits down all day, and he thinks about folding. And I don't know. He's uh, kind of interesting. He has a, a paper proving some of these SNES games. There's reductions from. Uh, classic problems to these SNES games. And so what, this, what, what are we trying to say Mario is NP hard? Actually, we'll talk about with whether or not Mario is an NP. First, you need to formalize the problem. What is Mario? So as a decision problem, we formalize it. Given a specific level, is the level solvable or not? Is there a path of button sequences Mario can push to reach the goal, the flag thing, right? That's the definition we'll use for uh, as a decision variant of Mario. Right, not within time or anything else. We agree that's what Mario is. Now what we're going to do is we're going to construct a Mario level that is solvable if and only if a 3SAT instance ha is, has a satisfying assignment. So what we're going to do is prove that the f a reduction from 3SAT uh, to uh, Mario. Any questions on what we're doing first? Like a uh, formulation of the problem? Yes. Yes. Yes, exactly. You can think of that as a harder relation. Exactly. Now here's another deep idea. You know, it's like if you do the Mario Maker, why does it make you solve the level first before submitting it? Uh, what they're basically, if you, th one maybe slightly incorrect formulation of this, when you submit a level to the Mario Maker thing, it makes you solve the level first, right? They're basically forcing, they're not going to brute force search for uh, an AI to solve the level for you or whatever, because if they did, you, by this reduction, you could trick the Mario Maker website thing to solving three sad instances for you, which you know is not a polynomial time solution. So that's why they make you submit the problem being solvable, and you could think of that problem being solvable like a witness to the, to the problem, right? You have to show that you can complete the level. Um, when you do NP-complete reductions like this over things that are not nice formulas or something simple, you have to use what are called gadgets. A gadget is a little doohickey. It's a thing that does one job for you to simulate part of something else, right? And that's the technical term. It's called a gadget. Now, what we're going to do is create a gadget for the clauses and create a uh, a gadget for the variables. So now we need to simulate the part where you choose an assignment to the variables. And notice that when you choose an assignment to the variables, you can either choose x or not x, but not both, right? So we're going to force Mario to choose one of x and not x, and we need to enforce that he doesn't choose both. Does this work? So here's our, what are called, what's called a variable gadget. So Mario comes into this level. Mario. Yo. 
Wahoo. And then there's these. Uh, so Mario can't jump that high, okay? He has to. Um, he's going to enter this sub level, and we'll chain together these sub levels together. This is called a gadget. Uh, he's going to chain together some of these together. Uh, we'll chain together these together, but in here, he's going to be able to choose only one of the left or one of the right, okay? And we'll, we'll correspond that the left one corresponds to x and that the, the right one corresponds to not x, okay? When he's there, he pushes on the mushroom blocks and he sends mushrooms down these channels, okay? He's going to send those to other, other gadgets, okay? Um, this is the... Uh, what, what, this is called the variable gadget. And observe that Mario can't jump high enough to push both x and not x. But which one he chooses to push, he is forced to choose one of x and not x, but he can't choose both, and he can't choose neither. Right? I suppose he could choose neither, but it'll make sense how we can't when we chain things together. Any questions on the variable gadget? Right? Next we have what's called the clause gadget. So at the end of the clause is a bunch of fire, and Mario enters from the right. Um, and now, you know, Mario, it ha if Mario eats a mushroom, he can tank one hit, right? But if he doesn't have a mushroom, if he's not the double Mario, he can't tank a hit. So what you do is you make him the small Mario, and then you add in some vents channels that may perhaps dispense a mushroom, right? So he can only go past this fire at the other end of the room if he eats a mushroom. So what we're going to do is have the, the variable gadget send mushrooms to the clause gadgets, and that's going to signify satisfying that clause. If the clause contains a not x, he's going to go here, push the mushroom, through the vent, the, it's going to wire up so that a mushroom is sent to the clause gadget. Then later on, as he goes through the clause gadget, he can only go through the clause gadget if the clause gadget was if the clause was satisfiable. It was only satisfiable if he chose not x or another variable that satisfies the clause. So this is the clause gadget, right? Let's wire up all the all the gadgets now to give you what, a high level view of what the level actually looks like. So Mario is going to enter in from the top left. After he, he's going to go through several rooms, each of which is going to be a, uh, a variable gadget. They're going to be chained together so that after he picks, the only thing he can do is go to the next variable gadget. Then there will be some last variable gadget, and he'll enter the clause gadgets. Something like this. Now each of these is going to be a variable gadget on the top. Each of these on the bottom is going to be a clause gadget, right? And then we'll put the flag all the way over here. Something like this, right? So let's suppose uh, this was the clause representing x or y, or let's say x or not y. Then what's going to happen is that he's going to be able to send a mushroom to this clause or like that, right? So what's going to happen here? Okay, Mario is going to go through all these variable gadgets. For each variable, he's going to choose an assignment of the variables. He's going to choose either x or not x. He can't choose both. He must choose one for each one. So by doing so, he's going to push mushrooms and send those to the appropriate clause gadgets. If x is satisfiable, well, if, 
if this clause gadget represents x or not y, then we'll wire up a vent for the mushroom to go down from the x variable gadget and from not y on the y gadget, right? So this is x and this is not x and this is y and this is not y, for example, something like this, right? So he'll finish choosing one of x or not x, one of y or not y for all the variables. He'll go through down, he'll come down to here and he'll be through a chain of torturous rooms. Each one will have fire on the end and a series of vents on the top that he can't get, he can't escape through. He's going to be baby Mario, so what he'll have to happen in order for him to go through a claws gadget, he has to pass the fire. And in order for him to pass the fire, he has to have eaten a mushroom. And in order for there to be a mushroom in that room, that clause had to have been satisfiable. So previously, he would have had to have chosen, chosen an assignment to the variables that satisfied that clause gadget. And the level is only satisfiable because we chain the clause gadgets in a linear way such that you can only reach the end if all clauses are satisfiable. Not most clauses or half the clauses, but all the clauses have to be satisfiable for this level to be true. Right. Any questions on the reduction, on the, on the structure of the Mario level before we prove the reduction? Yeah. You can have more clauses than variables. So yeah, that's fine. Uh, I don't have time to write the reduction, but I'll briefly explain it. If we'll go from 3SAT to Mario, if there exists a satisfying assignment to the 3SAT formula, then there exists a satisfying way to, to re there exists a way to solve the level choosing the right variables, right? Then you'll have a, a correct mushroom in each, in each of the clause gadgets to reach the goal. If, if 3SAT is unsatisfiable, then there is no assignment of buttons he could push to send mushrooms to the clause gadgets. Then 3SAT being unsatisfiable means there's one clause which is unsatisfied. He will die and end in that room and never be able to reach the goal. So again, we, this is enough of us to show that Mario is NP hard. Uh, Mario is probably not NP complete. We can't figure out how to show it's an NP. Uh, we're not sure what the witness would look like. The problem isn't formulated well enough. Um, that's all I have for you. Uh, have a good spring break.